Okay, our next speaker is Amin Timani on the logical essence of well-bracketed control flow. Take it away. Thank you. Thank you. Um, yeah, it's working. All right, so I'm going to talk about well-bracketed control flow, but what is well-bracketed control flow? We say a program is um, well-bracketed if in every function call, the caller can only continue after the callee is terminated, so it can take back the control. This is often the case, except if you have a concurrency or continuations in the language, then it is not guaranteed that this would be the case. This is an interesting property that has been studied in game semantics and also has been used as criterion uh, for uh, correctness of calling conventions. So that's why we're looking into this. So yeah, let's look at this uh, example, which I'm obligated to show you when talking about <laughs> bracketed control flow. It's a very awkward example. Um, it's a very simple program. The question is, does this program always return one or not? So this program first allocates a reference uh, R with value zero, then returns a closure that takes a function F. It sets the, rec uh, the reference to zero, calls F, sets a reference to one, calls F, and then reads the reference. And the question is, does it return one or not? And one might uh, you know, reason incorrectly that because f does not have access to this reference r, then it cannot affect it. So of course, the program should return one always. That is not the case. I will show you uh, one case where it is not the case. But when the execution is well bracketed, then it is guaranteed that it, this program will always return one. And the reason is that when you get to the point where you want to read that reference, um, if uh, that function f has uh, called the closure indirectly so that it, it has affected the reference, the last thing that has happened is writing one. So it will, the value will be one in the end. But to understand this a bit better, let's look at a concurrent execution that breaks this property. So here I'm, uh, I'm taking this, uh, the, the body of the closure there and um, run it with a trivial f function that doesn't matter. Uh, let's look at the simple, uh, simple scheduling of these two threads. So we can first schedule uh, the first thread up to before reading the reference. Well, in this case, uh, the reference has value one. If we continue, we would read one, but we can schedule the other thread to write zero and then go back to the first thread and read zero. Right, so here, we, we broke this property. Now the question is, how do we reason about well-bracketedness? Um, Previous work has um, built language models for the entire language to show that uh, because the language is well bracketed, then you can show that the program returns one or that the program is equivalent to this trivial program that takes f, calls it twice, and returns one, which again establishes that the program returns one always. In this work, we are, um, we are giving you a program logic, a, a whole logic that allows you to specify and prove that the program returns one. In this case, here I'm using this, uh, this parenthesis instead of curly braces for whole triples to say that this is a well-bracketed whole triple. It says that the program is well-bracketed, it returns a closure G, and if you apply that closure G to a function F that is well-bracketed itself, then you will get one, right? That's the reading uh, of this whole triple. But there's a, no, the, the question, why do we need a new program logic? Why couldn't we do this in the existing logic? So take uh, concurrent separation logic, uh, take, take Iris for example. I'm using Iris in this talk and we use Iris in, this, in the paper, but the ideas presented are not specific to Iris. That's just for formalizing things. So well, a concurrent program logic like Iris has to be um, consistent with the execution that we saw, a concurrent execution that returns zero. So it cannot prove that the program returns one, right? And if we look at the uh, sequential fragment of the logic, we still cannot prove one in that fragment, again, because it has to be consistent with adding the concurrency to separation logic, right? So what we do here is we introduce a new program logic which gives you new reasoning principles, um, which we call ghost stacks, that allow you to reason about the bracketedness and to prove uh, that the program that we saw returns one. The way I think about this is, uh, somehow like uh, invariance in separation logic, the way invariance uh, strengthens separation logic and allow you to prove properties of concurrent programs. Now, ghost states uh, strengthen sequential separation logic to allow you to prove more things. 
Right, so let me explain these ghost stacks uh, by going through uh, the proof of uh, how this VAE program returns one, how, how, we, how, we do, how we prove, how we establish the whole triple that I just showed you. Uh, to this end, let me first say that we, so for this, for this proof, we use a simple ghost state. Here's a two estate um, ghost resource. Uh, it has two estates pending, which I write with that P, and shot uh, with that S there. And the only way you can change the state, the only way that is allowed to change the state of the ghost resource is to go from pending to shot. The idea is that pending represents the state where the reference is zero and shot when the state, the, the reference is one, right? And this, this captures the behavior of uh, the closure that we saw from outside. Value goes from zero to one. But locally, we want to actually go back because when we write that zero, we don't know, it, it, might, it could be that the value is one and we are overwriting it with zero, right? So we want to go back, but it is not allowed by our ghost resource, right? So the idea is that here we use these uh, ghost stacks, as I will show you, to mimic this kind of behavior, to temporarily go back, um, uh, and then we have to revert that. The idea is that instead of using a ghost state, we use a stack of ghost states. Right? And we uh, essentially use the, uh, the ghost state that is on top of the stack. When you want to update uh, the state of the ghost resource, we just update it if it is allowed by the resource algebra. Uh, right? If it is not allowed, then we push a new resource on top of the stack. Right? This is our new resource that we are working with, and the program logic will force you to actually pop it before you return. That's how. Um, this, the, the behavior, the well bracketed behavior is enforced. Hmm? Um, now for, for technical reasons, uh, to enforce this stack discipline throughout the program, uh, we want to actually split this stack to give half of it to the uh, program, uh, to the user to use in the specification and the other half has to be with the program logic in order to enforce that the stack discipline is uh, adhered to. But of course, we, we cannot just simply duplicate our resources in separation logic. So what we do instead is we introduce a level of indirection. So we have the, ghost, uh, the ownership separately, and on the stack, we just store the names of the ghost resources. Yes, so um, recall the specification that we saw before. What we are saying here is that the, again, that the closure that we return when applied to a well bracketed function f will always return one. And here, well bracketed means it respects the stacks. Hmm? So let's see how uh, that actually works and how that allows us to prove that uh, this is specification. So I'm going to show a very high level idea of the proof for this uh, very awkward example. We start initially and we uh, allocate the reference. Here we get a location L in memory somewhere. Initially the value is zero and at this point now we can establish an invariant that says what we intuitively are thinking. That the, we have this ghost resource and the ghost resource on top of the stack is the one that determines the value of the reference. So if the ghost resource is in the state, uh, in the pending state, the value of the reference is zero, and if the ghost state is in the shorter state, then the value of the reference is one. And this is the, the invariant that we preserve throughout the proof, throughout the program. Um, yes. So at this point, uh, what, what we do, and at this point in the proof, we are looking at the body of the closure. We can access this, we, we can get the systems a stack at this point. And we know that there is, uh, it is of a certain shape, it has some state on top of it, some, uh, some, some ghost name on top of it. The, the important point is that we have to preserve it. By the time when we return from the function, we have to have the same stack exactly. Right? The, the, we should not change the names on the stack. This is the thing that enforces the stack discipline. When we write zero, um, well, we have to take that uh, dotted uh, line back, so that's where we actually push on the stack. Uh, we 
we get this new stack and then, uh, the, stack, uh, the state of the one on top of the stack is now the pending state. Um, and that's it until we get to the time where we actually write one on the stack. And we know here that the stack did not change when we, actually, when we called function f because f is well bracketed. It has to preserve the stack. Mm. So we have the same stack. Now at this point when we are writing one, then we, um, we yes. Then we do not need uh, the, this new ghost resource anymore. We can just pop it from the stack, this temporary one that we allocated. And since we are writing one, then we know that uh, on, st on the state of gamma one, we are in, in state shot, right? Value is one. Again, we continue. The function f is well bracketed. It will preserve our, our stack, which means that at this point, because on top of the stack, we know we have gamma one, and we know gamma one is in the shot state, we know that when we read the, the reference, we will read one, right? Because it, because it is impossible according to, I, I haven't shown you this, but according to our ghost resource rules, it is impossible to be both in pending and short states at the same time. Um, and by this, we are, we are also uh, showing that we preserve this, uh, this stack ourselves, right? So this is the kind of rely guarantee of the situation. We can rely on the fact that F preserves the stack, but, and we have to also preserve the stack ourselves, okay? This is the high-level idea of the proof. I told you that previous work has used logical relations or language models for a reasoning about well-bracketedness. We can do the same thing with our reasoning principles. So here are two logical relations. I don't expect you to read any of this. It's certainly too small anyway. Uh, for a concurrent programming language, so system F with, recurs uh, with recursive types and references and concurrency, on the right-hand side, the same system without concurrency. Right. And the idea is that these two logical relations uh, are essentially the same. The only difference is on the first line. So if we look at that, the only thing that changes is that for the well-bracketed version, we have uh, gotten rid of those uh, J's up there. Those are the thread identifiers. We have gotten rid of those. And we have uh, replaced the use of weakest preconditions with well-bracketed weakest preconditions. That's all. Now we have a well-bracketed program logic. We can reason about well-bracketing. So to conclude, um, I have shown you a well-bracketed program logic to reason about well-bracketing uh, and uh, the idea of ghost stacks and how we use them. There is quite a bit that I haven't talked about in the paper. Uh, please take a look. And everything that I have presented, all the examples, all logical relations, everything is formalized in Cock on top of the IRIS, uh, uh, the, the IRIS program logic, which is also available. Thank you. Thanks, I mean, again, as with William, you finished early. Uh, we've got very punctual speakers. Questions for Amin? Derek. Hi. Um, so, uh, yeah, this is very cool. Um, I have two questions. One is, so could you go back to slide six? Yeah, this, the, this one. Yeah, yeah yes. well, with the, with yeah. the dash thing. All right, so, right. Yeah. so, of course, this is like the public and private transitions yes. from uh, our, our logical relations work. Yes. So, uh, first question is, can you actually, can you directly encode the, the tra if you write down a transition system in that work with these public and private transitions, can yeah. you encode that in a sort of straightforward way, uh, uh, direct way? Is that in the paper? Yes, yes, it is in the paper. Okay, all right. Yes. Then the second, then the following question is, can you, um, have you found interesting examples where they were not easy, it wasn't easy to express the relevant invariant in using, using this kind of transition system and it's easier it, with ghost stacks? Um, or possible with ghost stacks, and it wasn't possible before. I, well, I, I, I don't think so. Whether, what is possible and what is not, um, I, th I believe ghost, st uh, ghost stacks give you more power. So if you have to, some other kind of transition, you don't, you don't have just public and private, and you want to have different, um, different classes of rela uh, relations, then... Yeah, I guess this is yeah, what then, I'm then wondering we, is if yeah. there's some then interesting... With stacks, you, can do, you can do more. Okay, but you haven't found any yet. No, okay. well, I haven't looked into any yet. More questions? 
Okay, while everyone else warms up, I'll ask you a question. So um, you talked about this stack of uh, uh, essentially resources, uh, ghost resources yes. versus a single one. Can you think of any other applications of them? For instance, as far as I know, Iris doesn't have unstructured control flow like for things like breaks or go-tos. Could you use similar techniques to support such unstructured language constructs, for instance, or any other applications? Um, we, we don't have go-tos, but uh, we, we did have uh, a few years ago, we studied a, a language with continuation, so mm -hmm. kind of the same thing. Um, now, how do I understand your question? You, you're asking if uh, it would be, we can reason about well bracketedness even in a situation where we have uh, willy-nilly jumps, mm -hmm. then um, I believe so. Uh, you should be able to dive. So I also discussed this uh, in the discussion section of the paper that you should be able to um, recover. I talk about well bracketedness even in the situations where you don't have well bracketing. So for example, you have continuations or um, algebraic effects uh, and, and things like that. Jump um, jumping is a bit more. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. You have to have a good reason to build, to to prove that uh, it, it, your your preserving well bracketedness, but. I believe you should be able to, to use these stacks to, mm -hmm. to prove that. And in, in general, to formalize these, your proof. with this stack of ghost resources, can you think of any other applications? I mean, surely, obviously, it's been very useful for reason about well bracketedness, but do you already, have you already planned out your next research question where this will be useful? <laughs> <laughs> no, uh, no I, I haven't thought about any other application yet. No. Oh, question from Matt. Hey, it's really interesting. So, it feels like you're making like making it easy when you've got things that aren't well bracketed, but making your life harder when they are a bit. And I'm wondering about the sort of tension there in because <clears throat> you're having to prove well bracketed all the time. And like, is there a sort of simpler? Mm -hmm. It just feels like maybe. Cool. If it's sort of that's the default, and then when it isn't well bracketed, it becomes much harder. So I'm just wondering whether there's a sort of design so, choice so there. That's the point. It does not become harder at all. Okay. Because we have exactly the same rules of sequential separation logic. So you can just forget about the reasoning principles, the ghost stacks. They, they don't bother you at all. You, you, you don't even have to see them if, if you don't want to. Ah, perfect. Yeah. Thank you. More questions? Okay, I'll ask you the hard question then. What about concurrency? <laughs> <laughs> we actually have, a, uh, have an example in the paper where uh, we have a, uh, a con an, what we call innocuous concurrency. If, if, you, if your concurrency does not break the well-bracketedness of the program that you're interested in, you can still reason about it. Mm -hmm. so, yeah. And what if it's not innocuous? <laughs> well, you don't have well-bracketing, so <laughs> okay. what do you want to prove about that? <laughs> um, I mean, so I wondered if, like, okay, you don't have perfect innocuousness, but most, maybe you have some invariant that talks about the, the well bracketedness being broken for a while, but it's established once you've established the invariant, the usual iris tricks. But, you know, you can break it for a while, but by the end you recover it and things like that. Like, but let's say you have, like, a like, thinking on my feet now, but, you know, you have a private class that's implemented in parallel, within that class it's encapsulated, well bracketedness can break for a bit, but outside it's not visible. Yes, I'm also thinking of my feet. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I believe you should be able to do that, but, but I cannot give you details right now. Okay. One last question from Amin, going once, twice. Okay, yeah. mm -hmm. Well, just to follow up on that, so I mean, I would mm -hmm. think that you, if you have, for example, a single threaded scheduler mm. and you're running you're running code under the single sing, single threaded scheduler in parallel with some other threads you would still be able to use this kind of reasoning to verify yeah. the correctness of some example like that running under the single threaded scheduler that's yeah, a typical absolutely. iris thing to do you just okay. yeah. yeah if you don't mind let's thank him in again